So I have a question that, and we'll get to some scripture here, but I want to ask you a question first. And maybe even if you have a piece of paper and a pen, write down your response, because I want you to think just for a minute on it. So if you don't have paper, just kind of mentally log this, what your response is now, and then see what it is maybe after the message. But what, did it, what do you consider to be blessed in your life? What, is, what does it mean to be blessed? Does everybody have a few things in their mind? What do you, what you think about what it means to be blessed for you in your life? Another litmus test of this is, what is your treasure in this life? Where is your heart? Because Jesus says in Matthew, he says, wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So it's a litmus test. So I want you to think about that. And then another question I have, and then we'll get to the The text is, what if I told you that I know the way to see God? What if I told you that this morning? At first, I would maybe hope if somebody stands before me and says that, then I'm probably pretty skeptical. And I think that's probably not a bad thing. Because there's a lot of people today and there's a lot of voices and they have a lot of access because of social media that they will tell you these things. And there's many that are extremely wrong I was talking with Tom Olande I have been to Kenya and he was visiting with us here within the last week and I guess there's a movement there that there's a, a man that's proclaiming the word of Christ that he's a follower of Jesus and he says the way to to see Jesus is to essentially fast and starve yourself and there's hundreds of people that are dying based on this one principle so there's a lot of people that say they know the way to God. But the Bible gives us some instruction in that, so we'll look at that. So a couple questions there. If you could turn with me in uh, Matthew chapter 5, an extremely familiar passage of Scripture. And as you're turning there, I want to read a verse before chapter 5. So we're going to look at the Beatitudes this morning and the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. But before that, we have a recording in uh, chapter 4, verse 16. And it said, The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region in the shadow of death, light is sprung up. So that is a pretext for what Jesus is going to preach here on uh, the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. And I'm not going to go into a great amount of detail about this as a backdrop, but I was in a, one of our American cities. I've got several trips that I've had here and travel. And again, it, it would not be appropriate for me from a pulpit to tell you what I witnessed with my eyes. But it is absolute darkness. And it's shocking to see the world that we live in, the depravity of the world without God. And yet we have access to His Word. We have access to Him because I'm saved. I can go to Him at any time. But because of that, there's many times I feel like for me that I'm calloused. I don't access God. I don't have the relationship with Him that I should. And each and every one of you that had a thought what it means to be blessed, we're all different and unique, right? But I'm just, the only one I can talk about in that way is me. But this isn't about me, it is about you and your relationship with Him. But I read that verse and I just think, there's a people there that sat in absolute darkness. They had the prophets, they had the Old Testament at that point. They, they were trained up as Jews to believe certain things. But then this Son of God comes, the Son of God, and was born to a poor family conceived by the Holy Spirit, which is absolutely under attack today, that He was born of a virgin. Yes, it is possible. Only once in the history of mankind is that possible, but it is possible because He did that. And when He came... 
they saw a great light. How blessed we are to see that great light today and to this place because as the dear sister said, I also went to places when I grew up that I remember preachers saying, not from this pulpit, but from others, that we are the last people here. I thank God that we're not. I praise the Lord that this gospel message continues to go out across the world. Just like when Jesus came and when he was about to ascend back to the Father, he left that great commission to go out and preach the gospel because it is so good and people need it so much. They need nothing more than the gospel. And we here in this place have the knowledge of that. So that's a great burden that we have in this place. It is a great burden I have as a man that's called of God to stand before any congregation and proclaim the name of the God. That's why it comes with so much turmoil at times and so much burden. Because we have that knowledge. But what a great privilege. So again, that's just a backdrop to the the text that we'll look at. So, in chapter 5, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Note that. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. I'll continue a few more verses. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt had lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill and cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Concludes the reading for now. Notice, and again, not the primary topic for this morning, but notice at the end of that, he talks about us being a city set on a hill and that our light would shine forth. And again, in verse or chapter 4, what I read, he talks about that light and darkness. And that's why at times when I'm Uh, trying to study that the Lord will just absolutely overwhelm my mind. There's so many thoughts. God is so good to us. His Word is so good to us and is so rich. But I want to focus on the Beatitudes this morning and, and several of these things. Again, when I asked you the question, what do you consider to be blessed? I dare say... And I I may be wrong, but I can tell you if I was asked to do what I asked you to do, what I would have written down, I don't think these Beatitudes would have been on my list. Now, this is not an all-inclusive list of what we're blessed as a people. Like these Beatitudes, what he calls blessed here, there's a lot more things we could talk about that Scripture talks about that is blessings to us. So it is not an all-inclusive, all-inclusive list of blessings. But this is a very important topic, a very important scripture that Jesus gives us here. It was early on in his ministry. He had multitudes around him. So this is obviously extremely important to him. And part of the reason I think that it is, is that this defies human nature. It defies our logic on what we define or determine is to be blessed 
So we should take note of that. And it tells us something about our sinful flesh and our minds and our hearts. We have to be very careful about these things that we follow and what we consider important versus what God considers important. I remember many years ago, I was struggling with something and my brother, I was like, we were talking about it. And I just said, right, I I can't understand this. I can't understand how God would see it this way. And then I said something in effect, because I I think it's like this. And just very clearly and very uh, quickly, he just said, well, God doesn't think like you. And that's a constant reminder to me because I think I'm right in all things. I think I'm right in many points. But that's why we have the word of God and we can go back to Jesus' teaching. He's saying these things are important. Because you won't find this in the world today. We're, uh, generally speaking, the materialism in this country that we live in, they're seeking other blessings in this life beyond what the Lord says is blessed. So I pray that we would not be seeking the things of this world, that we would not be seeking the things that some call blessed, but the things that God considers blessed. And on this Father's Day, I do consider it the greatest blessing to be a father. To have two children that are saved and one that's been seeking. What a privilege that that is. What a blessing that is. And to have a father and a mother that raised us up the best that they could here in this place. And the men and women that served here that are now up there. That is a rich heritage. That is a treasure that very few people have today. But you have that opportunity to broadcast that into this community. That you would cherish that. Hold tight. Hold fast to those things which are important. Because there's a great effect to that. It's an effect that I can't even imagine. I was having a discussion with a brother recently. And I I told him, like, what if all this effort that you did your entire life, toil, pain, strife, what if one person comes to know God through your work, For eternity, if I gave my entire life for one person for eternity, what does that benefit? What is that versus the cost? We can't even, you can't even calculate the difference in the cost or price that was paid for the benefit. Now, don't misunderstand me. God will save on his terms and those that come to him. We have Uh, I can't say we don't have anything to do with it because we do have a commission. We're supposed to take the gospel out, but we can't save anybody. So a couple of these that I want to look at here as far as what is blessed. Uh, A couple that stick out to me immediately are verse 10 and 11. It says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If somebody throws you in jail today... Well, let's just say me, I'm preaching. If somebody throws me in jail today for preaching the gospel, do I consider that a blessing? I don't even know how to comprehend it, quite frankly. We can read through history, even the beginning of this nation, where God's men that preaching the gospel were persecuted. We can read greatly about it, how Paul was persecuted. But I tend to think, I would say, woe is me. Like, Lord, how could you have this happen? You know, it could be in that genre of things. But the Bible says, blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. I'm not going to get off on this topic, but I think we're headed there. We're going to have to make a stand in this nation. God's people are going to have to stand fast. And regardless of the circumstances or consequences, be like Daniel, you can throw me in the lion's den, but I am not going to say or agree with you. I am not going to bow to this false idol. I refuse. Do you th- have you ever thought about that? I'm sure you have, but when they were thrown into the furnace, he did not know, I believe... He did not know if God was going to deliver them out of the furnace or not. I don't think he knew. But he is willing to go there regardless. 
Just pause on it. Think about the circumstances. Was Daniel blessed? He was taken away in captivity, probably as a young child. Probably had fairly good uh, circumstances that he was in because the deportees were typically the uh, king's children. They were uh, not just the average kids or the poor kids. So he probably had a pretty good life in Israel as a young boy. Deported. Was picked out by Nebuchadnezzar and the king's people. He was kind of set apart with his friends. But he lived in captivity. We don't know if he made it back out. We don't know. Scripture doesn't say. Some people think he did. Some think he died there in Babylon. But our definition, my definition, I'll just say, do I consider that blessed? Well, sometimes I would, but there's other times when I'm getting too close to the world that I'm like, well, I wouldn't want that. I can't stand here and say I'd want it now. But it's not about what I want. It's about what the Lord desires. And again, what he calls blessed. It says again in 11, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. We have many examples in scriptures about that, that men and women at times that were persecuted. He says here uh, that the prophets that were before you, he makes reference to that. Many of them were killed. We have historical account of all the apostles except John were martyred. It's not all in scripture, that's historical comes for good accounts, but all of them, except for John. And John was persecuted greatly. History tells us he was boiled alive. He was exiled to Patmos. And in Patmos, was John sitting around feeling sorry for himself? (laughs) No, the Lord opened up heaven, and he wrote the book of Revelation. Perhaps the book of John. We don't know which one was first. People debate that. doesn't matter. He wrote them both. Died to old age, it seems. And, you know, again, our flesh, well, how could clearly a man that the Lord loves, that the Lord Jesus Christ walked with, that I believe when Jesus was dying on the cross, he gave the authority to John for his care of his mother. I believe that's who he was talking to on the cross. How could he let him go through that great persecution For our benefit, we have this book in front of us. And it's blessed are he that are persecuted. We could read through the Acts of of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. I'm not going to spend the time to go through it. But he was ministering. And what happened to him? He was stoned. The Lord literally opened heaven to him. He saw the throne room. And who is witnessing and in an authoritative position over that stoning? Saul? What effect did that have on Saul? (laughs) Stephen was a good man, there's no doubt. But he was just a man. But because he walked with the Lord, because he had an understanding about what we're talking about here. As to whether he had this text or not, perhaps he did because it was he was stoned after this account. But it was probably carried to him by word, perhaps. But these persecutions, these great trials that we go through in our life, whether it be loss of a spouse or a father or trials through cancer, whatever it might be, we may not understand it on this side. But God has a great plan. We either believe He is who He is, or we don't. We either believe that He still controls the wind and the sea. And when Job, I love the book of Job, and in chapter 38, you know, there's all this dialogue across the whole book, and it's time, it's hard for me to read, and the back and forth, the back and forth. And then the Lord steps in, and I believe it's chapter 38, and answers Job. And again, you can read it. What he answers. But he says, where was you when I laid a line 
across the earth. We don't use lines in construction anymore. We use lasers, not like a plumb line. But it is as if God, when he spoke at alternate existence with his voice, he just laid a plumb line across the entire creation with his voice. And that's the one whom we serve this morning. And I can come in here on Sunday morning and be as cold and as callous. We all do it if we're honest, right? The preacher has a greater obligation because of the calling. So I don't know that he does, but at times I'm a, I'm a member in a congregation. I'm not pastoring. So I, we come into church tail on fire and I'm not prepared where I should be. It's because I've lost focus on these simple tenets that the Lord has given us here. So what does this look like if we go to verse 12? What I mean by what does this look like when we're aligned with God, when we're aligned with what we understand blessings are? Verse 12 tells us a little bit about that. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. You rejoice in the Lord? Rejoice just means full of cheer. I don't know that anybody would say I'm an overly cheerful person, per se. And you know, I don't, I'm not going to chase all that. I don't get to understand that with personalities at times. But he tells us to rejoice. I love to rejoice in the Lord. So my greatest memories in this place would be on Lord's Supper. And I just remember we sit over there and as a kid, I just, you know, like a lot of kids, you're kind of look and trying to figure out what's going on. And there'd be sometimes mom would get happy and start shouting and rejoicing in the word. I can rewind that back in my mind and play it back, especially on bad days. There's a, sometimes going to bad meetings or things, you sing the song, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. That's real. Kids, this is real. The things you're seeing in the world, I can't say they're not real, they're there. But this is truth. And we are going to get downtrodden again. But if we're getting persecuted, praise the Lord. If somebody says something against me because I have witnessed to them, praise the Lord. That that would have a great impact in their life. So it says, rejoice, which is full of cheer. It says to be exceedingly glad. If you look at that uh, Greek word there, I love that. And that's why uh, we study uh, I'm not a linguistics at all, but you go back to try to get the original text and understand, and it's easy to do nowadays with technology, um, but it says jump for joy. <laughs> I love to read that when David was praising the Lord, when he brought the tabernacle back in, and he was under great distress for all that, and understandably so, and of course one whose eye had tried to touch the Ark of the Covenant and the Lord dropped him dead because there was very specific rules about that. One, don't do it. And one, he wasn't even the right person to be handling it from the right tribe. But nonetheless, when the Lord allowed them to bring it back into the city, it said, David, the dance with all his might before the Lord. Can't you just like replay that in your mind? All that David had been through and he just danced with all his might before the Lord. So we should be exceedingly glad. I find this in times where we all have doubts, I think, and anxieties. And Paul tells us in Philippians to, to be confident. And again, when we found or founded on the rock of Christ, when all this other stuff seems to be moving in the world and we don't understand this and there's threats of war and You know, our son has been in Japan for the last year and a half, and there's just so many concerns that we've had, and there's just times I have to go back to the rock. Lord, not my will be done, but your will be done, regardless of what that means for me in my life and my family. Your will be done, not mine. And what a great assurance that is that we have, and people that don't have it, I don't know how they live or function. And then we see they really don't. They may have the appearance of being blessed. They may have large houses, large cars, big families, whatever it is, the metrics of the world, and it is not what God is talking about here. Though those things can be blessings for Him or are blessings from Him, but it's not what's most important. 
And he also says later in that, in this chapter 1 in Philippians that I'm reciting here, referencing is Christ is preached, therein I do rejoice. And of men in the Bible that had a lot to potentially complain about, he went through a lot, but here he is in prison. He's in prison at this point. And when Christ is preached, I rejoice. That's his response. Second part of this that we'd like to touch on, the second question that I ask is how do we get there? The way to see God. So that's verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So how do you be pure in heart? It seems like a tough thing to do today. Guess what? It was tough back then. It seemed to be really tough for Adam and Eve. You know, when I was lost, I, you know, I'd just make up things. And, you know, I was a kid. I was nine years old. But I would put myself in scenarios, I guess you could say. One of which was, well, Lord, if I was the, the woman that touched the hem of the garment, if I, if I saw Christ, if I was there, then I would have reached up and touched him too and be saved. Well, it doesn't work that way. That wasn't just an act of touching clothing. And I love that account because it's a really pure picture of salvation there. Because Peter kind of, I think I take a connotation that Peter maybe was a little condescending. Again, that's my reading of the text. But he said, well, Lord, the throngs press upon you. So he's in a crowd. So he's saying, of course, people are touching you. And Jesus corrects him, says, no, virtue went out of me. What a picture of salvation right there. When I was nine, virtue went out of God the Father because of the sacrifice of the Son and went into this soul that is in this fleshly tabernacle right here. And I carry that with me wherever I go. Again, regardless of what happens. So what is it to be blessed? To have that relationship with God and to know, regardless of what happens, that I am founded in Him. He is mine and I am His. In Roman it says that we're joint heirs with Christ. Think on it that God the Father sent His only begotten Son for me alone. If I was the only person that was saved in all of history, He did it for me. But He also did it for all. John 3.16 tells us that, right? For all mankind. And we parse people today. We parse about this and that and that. And God stands back, and I love you all of creation. I desire that you would all be blessed by me and by the sacrifice of my son. And people that I come across with. I was in a trout stream a few weeks ago, and we're having this conversation. This very nice gentleman's trying to help me catch these fish for a boy of our, a friend of ours, a son, and we weren't having any luck. And then. Within two statements, then we're talking about church, and he, he didn't know where he was headed. I'm thinking, wow, we're talking about flies, trout flies. And then two steps away, we're talking about eternity. There's constantly people in our lives that if we open ourselves to the opportunity... They need the truth. They desire the truth. And we are truth bears. So how do we get there? We have to have a pure heart. It is a difficult thing. We're subject to a lot of things today. Our kids are subject to, I'm not going to say more, because sin has always been there. There's nothing new under the sun. There, there really isn't. I believe that fully. These computer chips are just sand. We've, man has never created something from nothing. It will never happen. It is all just an assembly of things that have already existed. But with all of that comes a greater access to your family by the adversary through this technology. And we're not going to get that. But we have to guard our families, guard our hearts so that we're pure. The scripture tells us here, it, it's a blueprint, it's a roadmap, and Sometimes I'm confounded that even preacher brothers, there's times that we can really, and it's fun sometimes, a discourse or dialogue about 
things that we don't know about Scripture or maybe some gray areas or things that are unclear, and we can talk hours on that, but yet we may bypass things that are perfectly clear in Scripture. So he gives us what we should do to see these things. Verse 5, blessed are the meek. Do we have meekness? Do we carry that? This is a big one. Verse 6. Do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? I mean, do you desire it with all of your being? I pray that I would. I pray that I would just desire nothing else but the Lord. Again, that doesn't mean I forsake other obligation that he's given me. These things are aligned with each other. Because God can't contradict himself. It is impossible. So if I feel a contradiction in my life, like a pulling of work or this, then I pray. And like, Lord, you're going to have to resolve this because I can't. But you're going to have to resolve this. And it's amazing when I allow that, how that all of a sudden this aligns. It happens continually if you're observant. To me, it does. He also tells us here, uh, I mean, in reference to that point, though, uh, Matthew 7 and 7, he says, Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and ye shall find. Those are the words of Jesus. Do we believe his words or not? Problem is, many times I don't know that we're asking Or we're asking amiss at times. He also says here, uh, be merciful because we cannot do it ourselves. In closing, um, a couple other thoughts. One of which is our carnal mind. It's just enmity with God. Romans says it. Chapter 8. It's enmity with God. Because it's contrary. The flesh, again, is contrary to what God allows. It's just we're born that way. When Adam and Eve sinned, that sin has been carried down through entire creation. If you disagree with me, I'll, I'll buy your plane ticket and I'll show you some stuff I saw two weeks or last week. We'll go. If you disagree, I'll take you. It is evident, absolutely clear, that that statement is true. So how do we resolve that? By us? Nothing. (laughs) I can't do it. It's not within myself to resolve this thing that I'm talking about. If you're lost, so if you're sitting here this morning and you've never had a time and place experience with the Lord, you can't truly be blessed. And that may be a controversial statement. And I'm not saying the Lord cannot. uh, He provides protection. He provides everything that we have. Every meal that we have. Every breath we take is by Him. But you can't truly be blessed unless you know Him. I mean, there's a quite condemning verse. Uh, I'll just flip to it in John chapter 5. And it's a... It's a chilling verse because all this that we talked about Jesus preaching here in the, the Beatitudes. If I can find it here. Apologize, I'm losing my place here. I'll have to move on. But the Lord tells them that if you do not know him, then he will uh, take that to the Father. And I think uh, that is a condemning statement from him. So if you're lost and undone, you have to know him. Of all the things that my family's been through in life, and there's been many families that I know have been through much worse things, 
because of what happened to me there on April 13th in 1986, I was saved. That I know regardless of what happens, that I have that. But see, I want more than that in my life. That's just the starting point. I think sometimes that's where we miss it as Christians. That is the starting point. We can have a great blessed life when we follow after him. And to the church as a whole, as I've told you, I love you greatly. Sometime I've, I've had this dream that someday I'll be an old man and shuffling these doors and hear a group that's praising the Lord. And maybe the generations have passed where they don't even know who I am anymore, my parents, who they were. Because since I've left, there's another generation up. We pull up and I see these kids playing on the steps and my heart rejoiced. But that's my dream that I'd walk in and find a people that are still praising the Lord with all their might. But this would continue until the Lord says enough. I don't know if this nation needs it now more than ever. I, I, I wouldn't have the, the baseline to, to judge that. But I know we live in a dark place, in a dark world. But I know light always exceeds darkness. Light always wins. Jackie Wheat taught me that in a cave one day. Absolute darkness. And you light one match, and that light just searches every crevice. And it's amazing what one little light does in a dark cave. Each and every one of us are those lights. Every day. Whether I recognize it or not, that's my life. And if we follow the Lord, if we keep His commandments and I think really understand who a blessed people are, then He will continue to flourish us. Not in a way we may expect, but according to some of these beatitudes that we've seen. So I appreciate your patience with me this morning. I love each and every one of you and just thankful for the opportunity to preach God's Word.